Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Amanda PK. I'm here as part of the Rocky Mountain MS Center uh, group of physicians. Um, my role in the group is uh, not only seeing MS patients, but as well as uh, autoimmune neurologic patients. And here today, we're going to give a talk on the update on the biology of MS and related disease. We're going to discuss the immune system, particularly the adaptive part of the immune system that drives treatment decisions in MS, as well as other autoimmune neurologic disorders. We will also spend some time focusing on those antibody-mediated or autoimmune demyelinating disorders that can go undiagnosed as MS. So MS is strongly linked to the immune system through various mechanisms, including its genetics, evidence from neuropathology, and cerebral spinal fluid studies, as well as there's clear benefit responses to treatments that act on the immune system. Now beyond MS, we will discuss autoimmune neurologic disease. This category makes up a group of various diseases, all of which are caused by an antibody mediated process. The way these diseases work is that an individual has a dysfunctional immune system, which in turn causes the development of autoantibodies that recognize parts of the nervous system. And when these antibodies recognize part of the nervous system as self antigens, it causes neurologic dysfunction. Now these triggers can be caused by various reasons. Sometimes they're called idiopathic, meaning we don't really know. Sometimes it's driven by an infectious process, also known as a para-infectious process, or even cancer related, such as perineoplastic. The idea of an immune mediated mechanism causing neurologic syndromes in the setting of cancer, as well as viruses, was first described in the 19th century. In 1965, Wilkinson and colleagues discovered a neuronal antibody in four patients with a small cell lung cancer who developed sensory neuropathy. It wasn't until the 1980s, however, when studies began describing specific neuronal antibodies found in the context of different antibody syndromes. And then after that point in time, things really began to accelerate. In 1983, Greenlee and Brashier identified another Purkinje cell antibody in patients with ovarian cancer and cerebellar degeneration, in which case this is an autoimmune neurologic disease that causes problems with walking and balance. Then in 1985, a group with Posner at Memorial Sloan Kletter Kettering Cancer Center began describing different perineoplastic neurological symptoms in patients. The field really started to evolve in 2004, and that was when neuromyelitis optica, or NMO, was discovered in the setting of aquaporin-4 positive antibodies. This is also known as the NMO antibody, which we will discuss later in a bit. This was discovered by Dr. Van der Linden at the Mayo Clinic. Initially, NMO was once thought to be a form of multiple sclerosis, and this occurred before the discovery of this antibody. Neurologists speculate about whether NMO and MS were actually the same or if they were a different disease. Now it is very clear that NMO is a distinct clinical and pathological disorder. Although the initial clinical presentation can often mimic MS, as we will later discuss, because patients present with optic neuritis and spinal cord lesions, it is very important to differentiate between these two diseases because they have different treatments. The field of autoimmune neurology really exploded after the discovery of NMDA receptor encephalitis in 2007, as you can see with all these antibodies here on the right side of the screen. NMDA receptor encephalitis was described by Professor Dalmau's group in the setting of four young women who developed this syndrome of memory problems, psychiatric symptoms, and decreased consciousness with breathing issues. Uh, and all these patients were found to have an ovarian teratoma. Subsequently, NMDA receptor encephalitis was described in children, men, and women without teratomas. Beyond just NMDA receptor encephalitis, other antibodies against cell surface and synaptic antigens have been identified with increase in frequency, as you can see in red. The discovery of these cell surface antibodies had shaped the landscape of autoimmune neurology. 
It is recognized that many of these antibody syndromes can be readily treatable with immune therapies. And some of these immune therapies overlap with the treatment approaches used in MS, and some are different. And we're gonna get into this in a little bit. So first, let's take a step back and review some of the basics of the immune system. We need to understand the immune system and how the interplay uh, between the immune system and the nervous system can cause autoimmune disease. There are two main parts of the immune system, including the innate immune system, which is uh, covered here in purple, and the adaptive immune system, which is covered here in this pinkish red. The innate immune system is what you're born with, and it's ready to go to fight any kind of foreign bug or infection right away, and it's your first defense. What we will focus on today is the adaptive immune system. This consists of two main type or two main parts, B cells and T cells. The adaptive immune system is created in response to an exposure. So it can take a couple weeks to kick in. However, when it is activated, you get a very specific response. And that response is aimed at the offending target, such as an illness. What I want you to focus on here next is the B cells. These cells create antibodies. And so what is an antibody? An antibody is an immune globulin, or basically a fancy word for a protein, that is produced by the immune system to help fight infection. When the immune system starts to misbehave, then antibodies are created by the immune system that attack your body instead of a virus or infection. Now, let's get back to MS. Although MS clearly involves the immune system, whether MS is truly an autoimmune disease has not been definitively proven, meaning we don't yet have a clear identified MS antibody. And I do say yet. There are folks here on campus, uh, specifically Dr. Bennett is a leader on campus that continues to study this in his lab. And so we continue to learn more and more as time evolves. Now, there have been a lot of lessons uh, regarding the immunology of MS that have been learned, some by accident, and those are from clinical trials. It was really the um, discovery of the monoclonal antibodies, specifically that deplete circulating B cells that led to the decisive establishment of a critical role of B cells in MS pathogenesis. We have studies now on three different monoclonal antibodies that essentially destroy or lyse the CD20 B cells. Um, and those are rituximab, ocrelizumab, and ofatuzumab. And they've all shown a rapid and profound reduction in clinical relapses and uh, MRI changes with gadolinium enhancing lesions in MS. Interestingly, almost all other approved disease modifying treatments for relapsing MS reduce B cells especially memory B cells. It is not known if the major role of B cells occurs in the central nervous system or the peripheral immune system or both. Again, exactly how B cells exert this role in MS is not fully understood. Uh, you could see here in this figure in panel A on the left-hand side is the traditional view of how we thought about MS, meaning it was a T cell driven process and the T cells were the main contributor and controlled everything else. We have learned a lot throughout the years and in panel B on the right hand side is an updated uh, view of how we see B cells. And in this updated view, the B cell is a full participant in a complex network, meaning it uh, interacts, there's uh, two-way communication between the T cells as well as other innate uh, cells such as macrophages. So let's move on from MS. I'm going to talk next about some autoimmune demyelinating diseases. There's two diseases I want to talk about today, um, and this is neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, or also known as NMO, and this is driven by the antibody called the aquaporin-4 antibody. The other disease is referred to as MOG antibody disease, 
or also known as MOGAD. And this is the MOG antibody or myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein antibody. And why are these two diseases important to talk about? Well, they can look a lot like MS. Um, all three of these diseases uh, can cause white matter brain lesions. All can look like MS. They attack the spinal cord and cause lesions that can look like MS. And they can attack the optic nerve and cause optic neuritis just like MS. And so one has to be aware of these diseases when you're working up multiple sclerosis. And some of the key features in terms of the workup include blood work to test for these antibodies, as well as uh, CSF studies or lumbar punctures. So again, NMO is an autoimmune disorder distinct from MS. It is important to recognize because as part of the diagnostic workup, in MS, we should be checking this antibody in certain um, clinical scenarios. And again, that is extremely important because the treatments can be different. Now, moving on to MOG antibody related disease. There's actually a subset of patients with recurrent optic neuritis and spinal cord lesions that look identical to NMO disease but they don't have an aquaporin-4 antibody. And some of these patients were starting to realize that this may be caused to another antibody called anti-MOG. In fact, this particular antibody just became commercially available for testing in 2017. So what that means is we're still learning a lot about this disease. And so we can have presentations that look a lot like NMO, or NMO spectrum disease, that you don't have an aquaporin-4 antibody, but you have a positive MOG antibody. You can have clinical syndromes of transverse myelitis. You can have syndromes of encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain, often causing confusion, sometimes seizures. One of the most common presentations, particularly in adults, is optic neuritis, and it's often optic neuritis that involves both eyes, and reoccurs. And then lastly, there's a small set of patients that present with something called ADEM, which is acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, which you get white matter lesions in the brain and in the spinal cord. And it occurs quite abruptly and often occurs in children. So why is this important? Well, understanding the importance of B cells and how this impacts therapy and MS and related diseases. We're gonna move here to this slide. Now this looks like a very complex slide, but basically this is just the spectrum of uh, the B cell functions and where these different therapies can impact uh, the B cells. Understanding this has provided working points for distinct therapeutic interventions. Here are B cell therapies in MS. Right in the center, we have anti-CD20 therapies. Two of these medications are FDA approved now for MS, ocrelizumab and ofatuzumab. Rituximab is very sim similar to ocrelizumab, but does not have FDA approval, but we use this quite commonly. We have S1P receptor modulators, which don't directly work on the B cells, but they are important in um, shuttling the B cells uh, from the lymph nodes to the periphery. And these medications include fingolimod, saponimod, and ozonimod. And then there's additional S1P receptor modulators still in uh, trials, posonimod. Moving on to NMO. We have the anti-CD20s, rituximab is often used in NMO. Now this medication has been used for several years. It does not have FDA approval. It has not been studied in randomized controlled clinical trials in NMO, but we have used it for many years and we know it works in patients quite well. 2019, however, was a very exciting year for NMO spectrum disease 
because it was the first time we had FDA approved therapies for NMO and not just one, but now we have three. So starting in 2019, this began with echolizumab. We got uh, FDA approval. This was the very first treatment used for NMO with FDA approval. This was shortly followed by an embolizumab, followed by the most recent one, satralizumab. So moving on from rituximab, I'm going to point out here where where how these uh, other drugs work in NMO spectrum disease. Enemlizumab is an anti-CD19 drug, very similar to rituximab with the anti-CD20s. It's just a difference of what that receptor is on the B cell. And you can see right underneath the red box I have here, this first blue box shows you where rituximab works. This next red box shows you where enemlizumab Inilizumab works, and you can see that it acts on just more of the B cells, so potentially maybe a little more potent. Satralizumab targets IL-6 or interleukin-6, and this protein uh, signals immune cells and activates the B cells. What's unique about this particular drug, unlike the others that I just discussed in NMO, the anti-CD20 and the anti-CD19, this is an injection that goes under the skin. So it's not an IV medicine or an infusion medication. And then last but not least, especially since this was the first one with FDA approval, we went in reverse order, echolizumab. And the way this works is it binds complement. And, in, and basically inhibits the complement cascade, which is critical in inflammation. Now, typically your complement system enhances the ability of antibodies to work against bacteria. It causes a lot of inflammation and inhibiting this system stops the inflammation in its tracks. And it's really a key pathway that causes destruction in NMO because NMO antibodies like to activate the complement system. And this activation and this inflammation causes damage to the nervous system. So what about MOGAD or MOG antibody disease? Like I said, this antibody wasn't commercially available for testing until 2017. So we are still learning a lot. It is really unclear if this is truly a pathogenic antibody, meaning we know in NMO, the aquaporin-4 antibody is the problem. That antibody is activating complement. That antibody itself is attacking the nervous system. But we don't know with MOGAD. And studies um, are ongoing trying to figure this out. So without knowing that information and knowing the biology behind MOGAD, what is the best therapy? Are B cells the best therapy? They might not be if this is a primary T cell driven process. And so, again, very limited data. There is no uh, clinical trials in MOGAD. Uh, hopefully, we will be there in the next couple of years. But right now, all we have is uh, retrospective, so looking back in time to see how patients do on various medications. Rituximab is, has been used. It's not... It, it, reduces relapse, but doesn't seem to have a profound effect that we see in MS and NMO. Um, one study did come out and the medication that seems to work so far the best with reducing relapses is something called IVIG or intravenous immune globulin. Uh, but the verdict is really still out and we still need to study this more. So in summary, understanding the immune system is critical in MS, as well as other autoimmune neurologic diseases. Also, I hope you take away with this, antibody testing in the appropriate clinical setting can be very important in the diagnostic workup of MS. And finding these antibodies is critically important as these diseases, um, as identifying these antibodies has important implications for treatment. Since some things 
significantly overlap with MS and some do not. So thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this presentation and enjoy the rest of the webinar. <laughs>